Hi, welcome back. Well, I wouldn't want to be Mark Zuckerberg right now. I know I'd like to be worth a couple of hundred billion, but I wouldn't want to be preparing for testimony in front of a couple of committees this afternoon. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, this particular storm had its beginnings about three weeks ago when a news story about Cambridge Analytica revealed that they had misused data on 50 million Facebook users to, in political and commercial targeting. And Facebook itself, and, and the stories that have come out since, have made it clear that Facebook was culpable in this problem because they'd left the data exposed. More ominously, po politicians and regulators jumped on, uh, on the bandwagon, and it looks like that bandwagon is picking up speed and heading right at Facebook. In keeping with my philosophy that it's best to value companies when it's at the heart of a storm, I thought it'd be a good idea to take a look at Facebook, where it is, how it got there, and where it is going next. Let me start off with a little personal history that I have with Facebook. I've been interested in this company for a long time. In fact, before it went public, my first valuation of Facebook it was in the weeks leading up to its IPO. I valued the company at about $30 per share, and I valued it as a Google wannabe. Sounds like an insult, right? But if you think about it, making your company look like the most successful tech company of the previous decade, and Google is an incredibly successful tech company, is not an insult. I viewed Facebook as a company that would get almost as successful as Google, Google but not quite as successful, and I valued about $30 per share. Well, that particular IPO did not go well. Those of you who remember, it was one of the most mismanaged and uh, mismanaged IPOs in history because the company came out, and the, the offering price was set at 38, and then the investment bankers had to step in to try to support the price because the price kept dropping. That bad beginning led to a few really bad months, and by September of 2012, I remember Facebook was trading at $18. And I actually revalued Facebook and I concluded that it was time to befriend Facebook. And I bought Facebook and it was one of the few times in my life, and it was pure luck, that I've ever bought a stock at its absolute low. Now I'd love to tell you that I had the foresight to hold Facebook from 18 all the way to 180 or 190, or wherever it got to at the end of 2017, but I did not. In fact, I sold about a year and a half later when Facebook hit $50 because I felt that the advertising market was not big enough for Facebook to keep growing at the rates it was, and that sooner or later the growth would start to scale down. Of course, I was wrong in hindsight, because what I missed was the fact that Google and Facebook would not only continue to dominate this business in ways I never saw coming, but make the business get bigger. So Facebook's success, in, in a sense, I've shared part of it, but not much of it, because I sold at 50. So let's take a look at what Facebook's done since 2012 that's made them such an incredibly successful company. Let's start with the root of Facebook's success, which is in their users. This is a company that at the start of 2018 had 2.1 billion users. Think about it, it's mind-boggling. 30% of the population of the world was on Facebook. And if you look at the breakdown geographically, you can see that the highest penetration, not surprisingly, is in North America, where almost three quarters of the people on the continent are on Facebook. It's lower in Asia and Latin America and Africa, and you can see the potential for growth is there, but when you have 2.1 billion users, you can't be adding too many users every year because sooner or later you're gonna hit a global cap. But you can see that the starting point for Facebook success is just the number of people on Facebook is so immense. What makes it even more impressive is these users are not just on Facebook, they're on Facebook all the time. How do we know? Well, statistics on how many minutes people spend on Facebook have started to come in, and they're truly both scary and mind-boggling. In the U.S., which is where these statistics are most easily accessible, in 2017, people spent 41, uh, 41 minutes every day. So these are Facebook users, spend 41 minutes every day on Facebook and 25 minutes in, on Instagram. So collectively, users are spending about an hour a day on Facebook, on, on a Facebook site. And in fact, if you bring WhatsApp in there, it's probably gonna add to the time. So not only does Facebook have you know, mega users, but it has users who stay on its site all the time. Here's the most impressive aspect of Facebook. If all you had with Facebook was lots of users, you could dismiss it as another tech company that goes after users. Facebook is one of those rare tech companies that has managed to convert users into profits. And you can see this play out in their revenues that have grown exponentially over the last five years, and their operating profits, which are huge. 
How huge? In 2017, Facebook's operating margin was about 49.7% or close to 50%. But even that is understating its true margin because one of its biggest costs is technology and content, which is like a capital expenditure. And if you capitalize it, Facebook's margins are close to 57% actually between 57 and 58 percent. So let's bring this all together. This is a company with an immense number of users who spend a lot of time on its platforms and it's being able to convert these, the, these users and the, and the intensity into revenues and profits. That makes it a star. And you can see how much of a star it is by comparing its revenue growth and margins to the rest of the S&P 500. It's no contest. Facebook has margins that are, you know, that are five, seven, eight times larger than the, than the margins of many of the manufacturing companies and twice as large as, and more than twice as large as the median margin for a typical S&P 500 company. And its revenue growth has been impressive. If you are looking at opening acts in history, I don't think any other company in history has had the kind of opening act that Facebook has had. Now, before I drown Facebook in, in too much praise, let me also hasten to point out that even in its glory days, we were in denial. Who's we? All of us. Investors and Facebook as a company and users of Facebook. Denial in what sense? Well, if you think about Facebook's basic business, here's what it is. Users are giving information to Facebook by their posts, by where they are. But, so collectively, users are trading information about themselves in return for having this great free social media site where they can interact with family, with friends, with acquaintances, who God only knows what. But it is a trade-off that users have taken on. That's why I find it's a little hypocritical for users to complain about loss of privacy because this is a trade-off that unless you are in denial, you should have seen coming. From the company and investor side, there is, there is another set of denial. Facebook's operating margin is close to 50%, as you saw. If you think about why it's so high, one of the reasons I think it's so high is because Facebook has outsourced so much of its costs. Outsourced in what sense? You notice a lot of talk about third parties that have been involved with Facebook data and Facebook users. It's a use of third parties, in my view, that has allowed Facebook to keep the margins as high as they are. And it's a great business tactic, but it's also a tactic that's going to expose Facebook user data to far more vulnerability. And that's partly what's dri driven the current crisis. So here's where we were at the start of 2018, one of the most incredible opening acts in history. Five years of growth and users, user intensity, revenues and profits. This company was a star, which was why it was ripe for the data problems that were coming at it. And the data problems precede, uh, uh, pre, uh, you know, occurred well before March of 2018, which is when, when they hit the front pages. In fact, right after the U.S. presidential elections and, the, and Brexit, people started pointing a finger at Facebook as a culprit in the fake news problem. And so Facebook's been aware of it. It's been working over the last year to try to fix it. And in fact, in January 2018, when Facebook made its presentation to investors, Mark Zuckerberg was very clear that Facebook was going to take a different path. In fact, he, um, he, he pointed out that Facebook was going to change the way feeds, uh, that users saw feeds, that they were going to see more feeds that fed into user interaction and less passive feeds, feeds from outsiders or bad news stories. It was a del deliberate attempt by Facebook to face up to the fake news problem. In fact, markets were not happy about the shift that Facebook had announced in their feeds and stock price actually dropped 5% after, you know, after the announcements about the change in the feeds. But I think it makes clear that this is not a problem that started in the middle of March. It's a problem that's been brewing for a while. Of course, whatever advancements Facebook might have made with those announcements about the feed were drowned out in the middle of March when the Cambridge Analytica story hit the, hit the, um, hit the newspapers. Because um, what the story revealed was not just how exposed Facebook user data was, but how careless the company had been in keeping the data under wraps. Because the numbers which started at 50 million over the last three weeks, the numbers have gotten worse. In fact, Facebook itself let, you know, revealed that it could be as high as 85 million. And Facebook has also been very clear that it's been very careless with the data. And of course, markets have punished Facebook by knocking off almost you know, about $80 billion in market gap. And in the public, um, and Facebook has dropped in the public repute simply because it, the news stories have built up on top of each other. 
So there are some who are willing to write off Facebook. In the worst case scenario, here's what people see happening, that users will abandon Facebook, they will stop spending time on its platform, advertisers will flee, and that will cause revenues to drop, that there'll be huge fines and costs imposed on Facebook. And when this is all said and done, you've got the makings of a perfect storm, right? Flat or declining revenues, increasing costs that Facebook's value will implode. That is a worst case scenario. I'm not going to rule it out, but I think it might be a little too extreme, and here's what I see. I think users will stay on for the most part, that while they will complain about the loss of privacy, that most people are too attached to their Facebook feeds to let them go. That's what I think. Okay? Second, I do think some advertisers might flee, but most of them would stay on because what brought them to Facebook in the first place, which is this incredibly large involved user base is still there, and the targeting that they got that allowed them to target users is going to be still there. I do think data restrictions are coming. I think those data restrictions are going to come from both outside in the form of regulations and restrictions very similar to the EU privacy laws. And from within, where the company itself is going to impose constraints on how it uses data, how it manages the data. And finally, there will be fines. The, F the FTC and Facebook um, uh, had an agreement in 2011 where uh, Facebook agreed to take better care of the data. Obviously, it's not carried out its side of the bargain. And the FTC is going to make an example of Facebook, and it's not clear how much the fine will be, but it's going to be pretty substantial. So I converted what I see as the effects on Facebook into the numbers, and here's what I see. I see first a drop off in revenue growth because I think the user growth has already started to level off, but if you had visions about advertising revenues continuing to grow 40, 50% a year for the foreseeable future, I don't see that happening. I think revenue growth is going to drop off from the 50% plus that you saw in the last five years down to 20% for the next five years, scaling down to 2 or 3% by the time you get to your tech. The biggest effect, though, I think is going to be in the operating margin. Remember I said Facebook is among the highest operating margins of any company, 57% if you capitalize R&D, 49.7% if you don't. I think that part of what's going to happen with the data privacy restrictions with, from within and without is that costs are, are going to go up. And those costs are going to increase pretty substantially. As I see it, margins are going to drop by about 10, 11, 12% if you don't capitalize R&D and about 15% if you do. So over the next five years, which is where I think the bulk of the costs are going to kick in, I see margins dropping from down to about 42% from the 57% they are now, if you capitalize R&D, or to about 37 or 38% before you capitalize R&D. That's a pretty substantial drop in margin, big increase in costs. I also think that over time, Facebook's tax rate is going to rise towards a global average of about 25% because it's a global company. I'll keep that reinvestment at that, I mean, I'm giving them about $1.25 in revenues for every dollar of capital, but that reflects my capitalization of technology and content. My counting of acquisitions is part of the reinvestment. Based on my assumptions, I'm requiring Facebook to reinvest about $91 billion over the next 10 years, which is a pretty substantial amount. I will continue to give them high returns on capital because this remains a low capital intensity business and Facebook has a supreme competitive advantage in its user base. And finally, I'm going to give them a cost of capital in about the 70th percentile of all companies. I am going to assume that some advertisers are going to flee Facebook because um, for one reason or the other. So I'm going to assume a, draw, a loss of about a billion and a half in revenue. It's a pretty substantial loss next year. And I'm also going to assume that there is going to be a fine imposed on Facebook, and I'm going to make an assumption that that fine is going to be about a billion. With those changes incorporated, lower revenue growth, declining margins, a loss of billion and a half in advertising revenues right off in, the, in, in year one, and, and a cost of a billion dollars, what I get as my value for Facebook is about $181. At the time that I did this valuation, which was on April 3rd, the stock was trading at 155 I know I made lots of assumptions, but I felt pretty comfortable that I brought in some much of the negative stuff that I see as a consequence of the scandal into my valuation. Now, of course, you might say, well, why aren't you applying a margin of safety? As many of you know, I'm not a great believer in margin of safety as a way. It doesn't work for me. I'm not saying it's bad for other people. It doesn't work for me as a way of giving me comfort. What I prefer to deal with uncertainty is to actually face up to it. What I mean by that is I took Five of my big assumptions, revenue growth, operating margin, cost of capital, that fine that I foresee and loss of revenues, and I made them distributions. 
There's an element of subjective judgment in these distributions, but I'm essentially saying, look, I don't know what's going to happen. Let me make my best estimates. With those distributions built in, I ran a Monte Carlo simulation. And if it sounds fancy, what I did was I run, ran multiple valuations drawing from the distributions. And my median value across 100,000 simulations is about $179. No surprise there, it's pretty close to my base case value because my distributions were centered in my base case assumptions. Here's what's interesting though. As I see it, there's more upside than downside. If you look at the, 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 the outcomes from the valuation, my lowest value could be as low as $75 or $80. My highest value could be $325 or $350. So essentially, you can see that, my, my, that, that the outcomes of the valuations reflect more upside than downside, which makes me feel a little better because even if I'm wrong, I, I still get this, this upside skew in my valuation. So if nothing else, it makes me feel a little better about my decision to buy the company. So let me close up the, close up the discussion by looking ahead to later today. Mark Zuckerberg is going to testify. I'm sure senators are going to get on their soapboxes and lecture him about how terrible Facebook is. And the hypocrisy just hits me in the face because these same senators would have had no qualms about using social media data if it helped them win an election. I'm sure um, I've seen friends post about how horrible it is that data, uh, that, um, that this data, pri that their data has been invaded and that their privacy has been, um, has been shredded. But these people are posting on social media sites and they're revealing things about themselves that make Kim Kardashian blush. So there's a lot of hypocrisy here. We're trying to make Facebook a, a, a symbol of all the problems we have with society and politics, and that's not fair. I am going to buy Facebook and I'm going to do it with no apologies and no shame. I don't think it's a bad company. I think it's been very sloppy with the use of data and it's, and it's being punished and will continue to be punished for doing so. But I think that um, it's, it, remains a good business. It, it remains a good business that I, I can at least at right now buy at a decent price. That's about all I can hope for an investment. And um, I, I'm glad you joined me. Thank you for letting me um, get, get this off my chest with you. And thank you for being there.